Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. We have two terrific poets with us today, Tony Barnstone and Mary Fitzpatrick. Tony will read first. Tony Barnstone teaches at Whittier College and is the author of 21 books and a music CD. His books of poetry include Pulp Sonnets, Beast in the Apartment, Tongue of War from Pearl Harbor to Nagasaki, The Golem of Los Angeles, Sad Jazz, Sonnets, and Impure. He is also a translator of Chinese literature, an anthologist, textbook editor, and opera librettist. His awards include the Poets Prize, the Strokestown International Prize, the Pushcart Prize in Poetry, the John Chiardi Prize, the Benjamin Saltman Award, and fellowships from the NEA, NEH, and California Arts Council. His new book is a co-translation from Urdu, Faces Hidden in the Dust, Selected Gazels of Galib, and a creative, creativity tool, The Radiant Tarot, Pathway to Creativity. Here's a brilliant poet, Tony Barnstone. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, because my computer was uh, on the glitch, I'm doing this on my iPhone, so I'm going to be occasionally touching my phone so I don't read too long. Uh, Harry, I should read about 20 minutes, correct? Correct. Okay, so I'll watch the time. Hi, everybody. So I'm going to read from my new manuscript instead of old work because I like to test out the new material and see how it works. The new work is largely... Uh, American based, American politics, especially, but American stories as well, narrative poems that somehow or other tell me something about the state of America today and in the past. So I'm going to start with a poem called Bad Hand. Um, the poems are uh, longish, about a page, page and a half sometimes, but the narrative poems are probably pretty easy to follow because they're more like stories. This is called Bad Hand. The yellow mouth of the school bus opened to eat him, and he slumped into the fractured plastic of his seat, knowing at the next stop, the boy with the fingers chopped off at the knuckles would climb into the bus like a panther among squirrels, take the seat behind him, and grind the whitened stumps into the back of his head while he flinched. What combination of starry omens and planetary dread of boxcars and snake eyes could have spun the world inside this child's heart to such daily vicious thrill at the despair of other children, the ones with perfect hands. At lunch, huddled with friends by the mahogany stained folded up bleachers in the gym, he tried to ask them, but they studied dented apples and plastic-wrapped sandwiches in wincing silence. In their minds, the awful hand was reaching over the ruptured and taped upholstery again and scraping like a bone bow across their resisting bodies, grating out the thin music of their screams. These beautiful little boys and girls who flinched away from the stumps of his loss. They also had suffered the knuckle torture, also had avoided the bus home, preferring to stumble through the cut black stubble of the cornfields and be late for dinner. But they could say nothing. He was a fact of life, like brain-eating bacteria. So the boy came up with his own scenarios for what violence had severed that hand, a bad cut on a table saw, that spritz the sawdust red. Freak guillotining by falling glass, psycho stepfather with a hatchet. And often he wondered, what did they do with the severed digits? Did they keep them strangely preserved in formaldehyde, floating and pointing everywhere and nowhere in the green liquid of a screw top jar? Or did, he, or did they bury them in a small box out in a field somewhere, in the backyard, or in the backyard by the oak tree, like a time capsule floating in earth through decades in which that sad and terrible boy was fated to be the asshole of every story. A tiny, 
coffin in a makeshift graveyard where those fingers wait for the rest of him to join them. Those pallid fetuses, those curling orchids, those question marks, the pale nails growing into hooks. Uh, so it's a very dark poem. Um, actually, my, uh, everyone has their childhood bully. My childhood bully actually was a boy whose fingers had been cut off and he would torture children with the stubs of his knuckles on the bus by rubbing them against their necks and punching them. Um, I often wondered what happened to that poor child. Here's a, another narrative poem. They're somewhat dark, very American stories, um, very Midwestern stories, you might say. This is called Rec Room, and it's not R-E-C like recreation, but W-R-E-C-K. Andy's tenuous body is a hanger for bell-bottom jeans and a plaid shirt with one tail dangling. He doesn't tuck in his loose in the loose tail or comb his long, lank hair. His head is filled with hippie ideals learned from pop songs that assure him he is stardust, that he should let his freak flag fly, that all he needs is love, and that he should love the one he's with. But he's so shy that his leg is always skittering around under the table, and his voice cracks and stutters when speaking to girls and teachers. So when Anthony and Rick ask him to come over after school, he says, Sure, even though it was Anthony who shoved him back one recess so that he stepped right through his cello's golden belly where he'd laid it on the grass like an angel in a body bag. Anthony lives in a flaked and buckled brown row house three blocks from school. They trek through the lion grass of the neighbor's lawn and slide open the glass door below the balcony in the back to what into what Anthony calls the rec room. Concrete floor, torn red bench press and set of iron weights, chipped green ping pong table, dart board with black feathered darts, hunting rifle on a wooden rack on the far wall patched leather couch facing a small boxy color TV propped up on a wood moving crate. Anthony cracks the mini fridge in the corner and pulls out a, clan, a can of Schlitz. He punches Andy in the arm, peacocking a bit and grinning happily. My dad says men drink beer, just don't tell your mom. But when Rick bends over to get himself one, Anthony's smile tightens. He grabs Rick by the belt at the back of his jeans and lifts him in the air, arms and legs and ratty blonde hair dangling like a heavy metal spider. Fuck you, fuck you, fuck you. Ha, 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 ha. Anthony shoves a hand into the crack between the cushions and pulls out something from within, like a doctor pulling out a baby's head. He slips it into the VCR and the television cracks, crackles to life, moaning and sighing. Anthony plops on the couch and kicks feet up on a stool. Andy stands shyly against the wall, peeking at the small blue screen where bodies are coiled around each other like the supple, strange tentacles of a giant octopus. But Rick looks bored. He sits on the red bench and bends into a few curls. He tosses a dart and misses, hitting the pockmarked millwork paneling. He lifts the rifle off the rack, slips a finger around the trigger, and aims it at Andy's head. Andy is saying, hey, hey, but Rick is laughing. Andy walks left, right. He lopes through the door into the hallway, past two bedrooms, dark as burial chambers, and back into the rec room again. But Rick runs after, keeping the rifle pointed at his head. All the parts of it, action, trigger, butt and hammer, lock, stock and barrel, the black mouth of the muzzle, whispering death. The television groans in pleasure. Anthony is smiling with a hand inside his jeans. Lick, uh, Rick is laughing grimly as Andy runs through the house, the chalky skin of the drywall, fogged low windows like congealed white eyes, veins and arteries of the hallways, the panting heart 
of the television, the beast fur carpeting, and a voice somewhere screaming, oh! So I'm trying to tell little short stories in poetry form, <laughs> kind of a chance I know. Um, looking at the time, okay. So um, I'm gonna shift over to more political poetry. Thank you. Um, and let's think which one I wanna do. There's several. This is um, one I might try, okay. Um, this is a little bit more, it, 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 a part of the inspiration is that kind of elliptical movement of the mind that Robert, Robert Bly called leaping poetry, where you jump from one thing to the next, uh, and somehow or other, despite the fact that you're leaping from one thing to the next, it all somehow coheres. Um, so that's a bit of the way I kind of approach these political poems. Um, this is called Elegy for Liberty. America, I dreamed I saw you alive again last night. Twitter was riddled with rumors you'd been abducted. Maybe you had died. But there you were, wearing your cloak of twilight, stars spangling your hair, and you looked at me the way you used to, before things turned strange and bad somewhere, before you became the goddess of drones, the prison queen. I don't blame you, do I? I know you had a violent childhood. We never really get over these things. You told me once you were a human lighthouse, that the surf off Manhattan crawled to shore like huddled masses. So I need to ask, what changed in you? America, I thought you loved me. We raised a murderous child together. The empty sky is raining fingers. Somebody flew an airplane into the towers of night. They smashed the city teeth. And now your sky is a shipwreck and your toxic fumes vacuum into our lungs. I forget, I forget what I was saying. I was saying something. I'm speaking this to you on the freeway, trying not to die. I know your freeways aren't free that your highways take the low road, but please stop tailgating me with your monster truck. Your wind is trying to undulate the flaccid flag. Your spirit ripples palm tree fronds. Your face is a locked door. America, I want more. Going to California, with a suitcase in my hand. Actually, I drove there in a carpet cleaning van and all the way from Indiana, the highway was littered with your refuse. Those you refused, the refuseniks, the ones whose cars broke down and waited on the roadside and fell in doomed love with the mechanic who picked them up in his pickup truck and never left this nowhere town with a gas station and a mini mall south of the interstates. Another roadside passion, that's what I had for you. Another drive-by fatality, that's what I was to you. I'm driving by Cherry Lane, Target, and Food for Less. The Subaru in front of me has a license plate that says, Thirsty. The grinning, skull-faced grill of a smashed sedan eyes me from the car carrier. My son came home and said, Daddy, there are strangers who want to take us away. When they come, we have to lock the door and hide in the back room. America, why do you love your firearms more than you love me? Your life had stood a loaded gun, something the undertaker understood. I undertake to understand how it was that you loved me, even as your finger around the trigger curled. So um, <laughs> American gun violence, uh, the theme of that one, obviously. Um, and time wise, looks like I have time for 118, started at 105. Uh, so uh, probably got two more poems. Um, I uh, have different ones to go for. I think I might go for um, this one, which I've never read out loud. But why not? Let's give it a shot. It's um, a pandemic poem. I'm sure everybody's written 10 million of them. It's called The Plague. 
and uh, let's see how it works. Um, it's it, it, the unusual thing about this is that uh, it's all written in haikus. It kind of hangs together, but every line is um, a hi- is actually a haiku. So five seven five. Um, but I don't think you'll, you might be able to hear it in the kind of pauses and the the, the rhetoric. But but anyways, that's uh, and it has uh, the haikus are marked with like Emily Dickinson dashes. So this is the plague. In college, we tried in a stoned game hypnosis, but just my girlfriend went under her dark, still face, Madonna serene, lost inside herself, large, luminous eyes, lightly closed against the light. When a mocking boy in a Dodgers cap asked, what do you want to be when you grow up? She whispered, a cabbage. We laughed. But she got her wish. We nest in houses, hunkering down in vegetable rows, folded in on ourselves, fallow. Strange liberation. Right down the center, the yellow center, I walk the plague streets. Odd joggers giving eight feet of birth not to share the same dreadful air. We are the last ones on earth, keeping distance, so scared and wary. Press the cold button with one knuckle. Hold my breath. A steel voice says, walk. Cannibalistic nightmares crawl out of the mind with sick gray faces. Ah, humanity. Dramatic stance. Hand on heart. Can't laugh at that joke. Coyote nosing a plastic wrapped trash bag pile in San Francisco. Swarming pathogens. In crosswalks of New Orleans, the rats are teeming. Desiccated ghosts were disappearing. We flap like hospital sheets. We have gone to ground animals with wounded paws. We chew at the pain. We hope the angel of death cruising through the sky doesn't make a stop. Crow on metal post, black knife wingtips, button eyes hungry watching me. Like a newspaper with a broken back swirled up, swirled up, then crushed down our lives. And we wake to dreams of walls, infinite maze. No one finds the door, closed doors, wooden teeth, ghost-drawn da- shades. No one watching, blank-eyed houses. Yet see that TV flash? Curtains lit up like stained glass, music through the walls. The stagnant water stanks up the air with specters, disembodied grief. These days we are all like that famous blue raincoat torn at the shoulder. Outside, the strange air will stab your lungs and brighten the sky with fever. Whiff of someone's smoke, choke it out, frantic murder. We breathe borrowed air. Yet... Newspaper crushed to earth, learns to fly again, spreading paper wings. Disinfecting sun on my shoulders, I will greet my neighbors again. Out of a dank cave, we'll climb and fearlessly breathe uninfected air. The dark, fatal bird perched on the shoulder, pecking the neck will have flown, and we might almost hope that we won't resume our routine violence, cursing everything by living the way we live, by being the plague. Uh, So um, that was uh, all haikus, strangely enough. One more poem and I'm out of here. And we turn it over to the great Mary Fitzpatrick. Um, Let's see. How about, I don't have any happy poems. They're all dark. Uh, I guess I will... This one's somewhat shorter. It, it, it's not a happy poem, I'm sorry. It's one of the more narrative poems. It's a dramatic monologue. It has to do with the prison industrial complex, uh, the ways in which people are uh, assigned to solitary confinement, sometimes for decades on end, going crazy in the process. This is called Solitary. And thank you for having me, by the way, before I, before I finish this poem and sign off. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Harry. And wonderful to be uh, here with you all, and especially you, Mary. Solitary. I'm in the gray box. The fluorescent light hums to itself and never stops humming. 
Sometimes I don't know if it's the light or if it's me humming, like I'm a beehive and there are bees in my head. The walkie talkies are jabbering. Out there, they are walking and they are talking. In here, I swear I can smell the screams from down the hall. They got someone whispering into the vents because sometimes I hear that tiny voice. Sometimes my hands curl up like grubs and I can't uncurl them. Sometimes I catch myself smacking my lips, freestyling without words. I just have to stay focused. I don't want to turn into one of those guys. I don't want to turn. I don't want to be the guy who bites his arm to see the blood, who smears his shit on the walls the guy who bites off his own fingers. One day, somehow, a cricket got into the cell. God damn, it drove me crazy. Tiny thing, I searched for it for days. Where the hell was it gonna hide? And then, when I found it, I grabbed its li little rickety leg between my fingers and raised it to my eye. I laughed and popped it into my mouth. Then it was like all the angels came shining through the plexiglass and filled the room with glory. Finally, I had won something. But afterwards, the noises rushed back in, 10 times as loud, the door clangs, the wild cries, the walkie fucking talkies, and they beat about my head like an invisible bird. And I said, it's not that bad. It's not so bad, but it was. That Thank was, you. That was a wonderful reading, Tony. You have your observations are so precise and you have such strength of narrative and a wonderful imagination. Uh, I, it reminds me of Blake's saying, you know, energy is eternal delight. <laughs> you know, we have a couple of minutes before I introduce Mary. When did you write your first poem? Oh, my. Uh, as a very young child, my father's uh, a writer has published some 80 books, and uh, he had uh, my, uh, all of the children would come together um, uh, and play what we called the poetry game, where we all threw out wor random words, and then we would all write poems. So I probably started around the age of six. Now, what is it about the poetry form that attracts you to it? Uh, it's a crystal, a jewel. Um, you know, uh, a novel can tell, can give you uh, a great epic uh, depth of uh, of narrative and uh, psychological intensity, but um, a poem takes a takes a, a kind of a key moment and crystallizes it in such a way um, that it becomes a place of power. It's a way of um, uh, being mindful in a sense, taking all of your future hopes and past traumas and uh, and present uh, observations and crystallizing it into one, like Superman taking a coal and crushing it into a diamond. Well, I know you're a teacher. And what would you say to a young poet who is writing her first poem? What would you tell her? Where would you tell her to put her focus? Would it be emotion, an idea, an image, words? How? What would you say to a young woman beginning her first poem? Um, believe what you're writing. Don't write what you think. Don't have write with all of the tradition looking over your shoulder. Uh, if you uh, if you write with a whole man, the whole woman, with your whole self, um, and you write intensely and directly, um, then that intensity in and of itself can have even more power than all the most ornate, extraordinary images and symbols. So I would say balance uh, direct uh, um, direct intensity with a more literary side. That's one thing I would say. Um, yeah. And who are a couple of your literary influences? Oh, there's so many. Um, it depends what kinds of poem I'm writing. Uh, if I'm writing the sonnet, it's going to be, uh, Yeats and Shakespeare and Borges. Uh, if it's, if I'm writing free verse, uh, a, a lot of it's going to be a kind of a balancing act between, uh, the precision and inc intensity of Emily Dickinson and the kind of the wildness and the, uh, uh, the breadth of a, of a Whitman or an Allen Ginsberg or a Neruda. Well, you certainly have a large range and tremendous depth and it's a real honor to have you here. And we hope you'll come back again sometime. You have such a bright light in the poetry world. So thank you very much.
Tony. And our next poet is Mary Fitzpatrick. Mary Fitzpatrick's poems have been finalists for the Joy Harjo Poetry Prize and the Slapering Hole Hall Chapbook Award, shortlisted for the Fish Publishing Prize. And her poetry has been published in such journals as Agenda UK, Briar Cliff Review, Chola Needles, Hunger Mountain, International Literary Quarterly, Mirror Mar, The Patterson Review, Craddock, Red Canary, Terrain.org, plus 10 anthologies. A graduate of UC Santa Cruz with an MFA from UMass Amherst, she is a fourth generation Angelino who lives in Pasadena and feels at home in Ireland. A wonderful poet, Mary Fitzpatrick. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much, Harry, for inviting me to your wonderful show. And thank you to the Motion Picture and Television Fund. And I, I just love that you do this in honor of Holly Prado, an iconic LA poet. So thank you. And thank you to Tony, who, um, Harry, you're right, he is an eclectic Big tent poet. That's how I like to think of you, um, Tony. And you're a very generous and inclusive editor. So I appreciate that too. And I wish to also thank all of the listeners who have tuned in today, <clears throat> friends and family and fellow poets. Welcome. <clears throat> I'm starting with three poems about Los Angeles. The first one is um, inspired by a poem by Kenneth Koch. His poem is One Train May Hide Another, pretty famous poem. This is called One Face May Hide Another. I wait at least a moment and see what is already there as at a crossing when one brindle bulldog may hide another while evening cools the air. And though one can scarcely believe in a creature so preposterous, yet when the light changes, there is another that appears. When their leashes split from a single hand, and if I wait, I'll surely see the other holding a cell phone, for no walker is disengaged as at a stoplight, when one looks left to see what one expects, the next driver with a cell phone, but sees instead a brindle bulldog on the driver's lap, a second bulldog in the back, the driver searching for her cell phone. Now, looking up, one scouts around to see if the streets aren't full of brindle bulldogs, but finds instead they're full of people dressed in slim black pants who haunt the sidewalk, step in and out of cars. Some have cell phones, some red hair. One recedes in her red sandals. The undersides wink at me with each step red, white sole, red. Then one's a red dot on a parrot's cheek and another parrot shrieks as they hurtle. Gadflies tree to tree. And I look at least a moment, see red flowers in the flame trees which then take flight as parrot's cheeks, receding with each flap, dodging people on the streets dressed in slim black pants. And one is your friend, one is mine, and one holds a cell phone or two leashes in one hand. And though I thought I saw you once before, it was instead someone who resembled you and paused and stroked her chin just to consider if I was her cousin or her cousin's friend or simply looked like her, then drove away with brindle bulldogs. <laughs> this poem is shorter, called Los Angeles. 
In a world being made new each day, perhaps I should trade my love of things eternal for the thrill of what is novel. My quiet glade, my lovely mist on the market, ravenous for what's unique or what might not exist. I figure if I'm a native Angeleno, I get to do a little dissing here and there. <laughs> and this is my third Los Angeles poem. Vehicle, an autobiography. I drove my young adulthood from pool of sunshine to concrete tunnel, marked the passage of my days in miles on LA County roads. I drove every day after 30, relishing the queenly safety of my box, missing the wild and dangerous subway bus variety of my fellows. Yet danger tracked me still, slick roads, sudden dogs, a breached stop, and worse, the wafting fog of daydream. I braked so I would not plow, standing and owning that embarrassing screech into sudden taillights ahead and snap to realize I knew not how I came there. Maybe that was Irwindale, treeless, granite, empty riverbed beside the 210 and 605 juncture. And still I drove sometimes into dawns that stopped my breath with their winter beauty when tree limbs unveiled their fine cut silhouettes against what rose or radish the sky had chosen to become. Then I drove my mouth open, skimming past peril as when a man walked his tender body across all four lanes of the 110 North's fatal speed channel, nonchalant hands in pockets as if he did not care he died. Or the woman who, accelerating into the 405 center divider, showed me her profile, flat and featureless as a smooth potato. I drove eyes forward, constantly glancing up at the danger behind me, holding in my mind, like a hand of cards, four numbered freeways I'd traverse in sequence, plus merge, and then picking an ace and exit where noise would stop and streets would crowd with color, trees and people. The turns I'd make to park and then remember that sequence in reverse again. I aged in that car and then the next, driving to and from work, driving my children to school late, then home from daycare usually late, in the warm dark where secrets were shared and eye to eye was through the rear view mirror. Certain structures saved me, the blessed seatbelt, the cup holder, sun visor, sun visor with mirror, makeup applied during stoplights, or lap napkin spread like a tablecloth, breakfast as I nudged my way with other commuters solitary yet in unison up and to the metered freeway ramp. I considered making a quiver of signs I could scold or thank them with. I drove feeling sorry for the staunch flow on the other side, drove feeling sorry for myself when my lane crawled, searching my mental Thomas guide for places to get off, just to keep going. I drove with a poor sense of direction. I drove past recognition of high school haunts, time when I had learned to drive, and my first bitter taste of nostalgia through the open window of that final box, wind in my face, 
that brought me home to a city in perpetual flux. Dirt still disappears under stucco tracks. The creases in my forehead deepen. I catch them looking up at the mirror that reflects an afternoon sun burning off buildings of glass, a sun that sinks miles later behind me where I can see it fall, orange in its own violet trough. Something we all have in common, the road warriors. <laughs> I'm going to make a little transition here um, to seasons and nature. And um, this first um, in this sequence is from a, a series of poems I wrote called In Time of Drought. And boy, I thought that would have a limited lifespan, but I was wrong. And Tony, will, this one will be familiar. In Time of Drought, West. Morning dark but moon full sinks at the end of our street. We hurry breakfast books, our bodies, and drive right into that silver palm of God. Ask for whatever you need, and it shall be given you. All year we've prayed for rain, and still plants around us brown. Observe the silver orb in space, naked and lucent in its mirror place. Its only shadows, land, and the ravages of heat. Hope, swept of all illusion, prays, do not abandon us like that. Summer in Decline, and this poem appears on uh, terrain.org's website. Summer in Decline, high gloss filament flung across trees, catches light in shifting air, as do the wings of gnats too small to stick, of moths stumbling off to sleep, as do the thrumming fans of hummus. It is Mid-August, summer dug in and resisting its descent toward fall. For me, witness to plants spent appeal, there is one prayer. Let autumn come. Everywhere, a deep desire for rain as miles and miles of woods go up in smoke. Pine, alder, sequoia. Oak, and two, my own sick redwood struggles, crisping brown and shed. It has become a lonely pole for filament, neatly strong, catching beads of light and tiny winged things waiting to be torn down by rain. Mm -hmm. September, Lake Como. Summer wanes and the lake's dulcet weeks, cocktails on floating craft, heat pressed in the bowl of mountains, descend to the purpose of autumn. Even harvest, just plucking summer's yield means work. He goes on ahead to the city bent to his purpose, and I linger over the swept remains, inebriated on summer's fruits, grapes hang, and vine leaves yellow, stalks brown, corn and tomato. I'm grass, Yielding to soil's warmth, breathe and my seeds come undone. The lake ripples its sheet of olive silk, 
no one will miss me. I'm leaving the land and heading out to sea here. Um, and this is a poem that appears in Red Canary Magazine online. It's called Beckon. As the ragged fluke disappears beneath the waves, beneath the blue, beneath the faceless dark, we look for it again, a welcome puff, welcome spout. The spray is breath, and that's relief from the great unyielding field of sea, wet and nameless. But for this fellow I and will, whose simple brawn shrinks all else and slides a ridged hump, a spine, split rudder, paddle tail, dark above and white below. And who sees the vast pale underbelly and does not weep, does not sing, does not slip into the sea's great trance? and follow, swallow, bellow. Landing the halibut. Put yourself on the northern sea here. Landing the halibut. I saw the way she looked at you with those stupid eyes together, pop side. And we agog in our eight foot skiff, ice chunks floating by, barely longer than her bulk. Her fringed edges hung over the side, too wide, wavering for a hold. I looked away when you brought the hammer down and blacked her 80 years that day and hushed her gasping gills. And having hauled her in, your sense seams and sinews bursting. What else could you do unless heave that great wedge, shocking white beneath back into the inky sea? After she'd given herself to you, swum into your trap and stayed. How sweet she was and tired. Her flesh tasted of the ice and granite flowers on the floor of Sumner Strait. I sing her still with some remorse and hungry, lift her body whole into our fragile craft. How to draw a quail. <laughs> First, the full breast, round and heavy as a mushroom, nestled in the grass, gray as morning fog's silk stockings. Next, the wing, Hinged on back, opposite arc to breast, done and flecked with grass seed heads, due invisibility. Head, a small periscope on a stumpy neck, swiveling for what teeth would not love this body. Hard pencil, her black beak made for seed and cacking an urgent call to bring chicks running. Top knot, a curl, a question, a prize. Inky velvet wiggles when she walks, every milliner's dream. Blacken in the chin, her tail I can't recall, blunt version of a turkey's fan or some russet longish feathers. Never mind, we'll see it when she leaves. 
And here is my last poem, and uh, it's a pandemic poem composed early in the pandemic. And this is um, going to ap appear on the Silver Birches Press website called Days of Honey. Similar, um, I think, to yours in a way, Tony, that we'll see. Days of Honey. Looking for light in the pandemic, we note that the bees have returned. Vivid in their occupation of the clean box I'd readied, lured by seven foot sage blossom stalks. I'm reassured there are enough to break away and form this hive behind our garage, just in time to double our pomegranates. A wealth in any season, and especially now. It's been three months. By November, when the pomegranates lose the red fuzz under their yet leathery crowns, it will be nine. Our times become timeless. Is this B.C. or A.D.? Carthage, Ephesus, Campania? Make the days count. Build up achievements or indulge as we've always wished. Lift a rack of honeycomb from the hive. It teems and glistens and let gold run all over the day. Thank you for such a marvelous ending and a poetry reading. You have such a great range. I love your LA poems. You know, they're so real and they're so reassuring. I love, I've always, all of us who live here in LA, we drive so much and I love the, what you saw on the freeway and the movement from you know, one to the other. And you have such a, I don't know how to describe it, but it's a quiet, even elegance and within you and what you see on the landscape. And and it's also very hopeful. And, uh, you know, you've really taken us on quite a journey. This has really been a wonderful reading. So Thank I you. want to ask you a couple of questions. I ask Tony, when did you write your first poem? Um, well, I did not have a father who was a poet, but I do think I wrote my first poem when I was about six years old also. I fell in love with words early in life and was, you know, praised for reading early and that just fed it. And um, uh, growing up in the Catholic tradition, the notion of chant and song and um, litany and liturgy, I think that permeated me and um, that informs me still. And uh, what attracts you to the poetry form? You know, I don't have a sufficient attention span to do a novel. And um, so whatever I feel an urgency about, it goes into poetry. And I like um, very much the way Tony described it, that notion of the jewel or the, I call it a distillation where um, you, sometimes you gather in the excess because the excess contributes, but other times you pare it away to um, deliver um, a vision to the reader or the listener that matches the vision that you're experiencing. But the Superman with a with <laughs> coal uh, crushing it into a diamond, I love that, yeah. And who are a couple of your influences that you read before you started writing, well, you started writing at such an early age, but when you started writing, in a serious way. You know, um, lots of influences again and um, many different kinds. So also Walt Whitman and, and Emily Dickinson, the opposite ends of the, of the polls. I was very influenced by the Imagists, um, HD and Ezra Pound. Um, today, I love Mark Doty. I love um, Dorian Lux. I love so many of our contemporary poets and um, James Wright. Um, I, it would, it's a difficult to narrow it down. There's a lot. Well, you know, we have about four or five minutes left. Why don't we bring uh, Tony on too, in terms of talking? I mean, why don't you two 
you, you're very affectionate toward each other, and I, I can see how much you care for each other's poetry and and each other. So, Tony, why, what would you like to say about her poetry? And then, Mary, why don't you say a few words about Tony's poetry? Tony, uh, I, I, just, I, I love the reverence for nature and the play, uh, and the and the uh, and the close attention. I can definitely see the James Wright in your poetry, uh, okay. without without all the sorrow there, without, without all that alcoholic sorrow. <laughs> <laughs> but that sense of the grace of nature and um, the spirit of nature, I, I, I see that very much in, in your close attention in these poems. That's great. And, and Tony, I love all the voices you collect in your poems and the characters. I mean, just the ones you read today, those, um, those poor kids, both the victim and the perpetrators. Man, um, and I love, I just love the breadth of what you do, your translations from the Asian languages and, um, oh, my timer's going off here. Um, <laughs> so I, you bring so much in, and I think that that is one of the beauties of our LA poetry world and you kind of embodying that in a way, all the multiple voices that we have, and you do a lot of them. <laughs> 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 just, just a little bit multiple personality here, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I'm a little bit older than you two, and I remember when I was first got into poetry in 1966, and I read the New American Poetry, mm -hmm. 45 to 60 in Grove Press, et cetera. So you'd see Paul Blackburn using the page and moving, you know, left to right, and uh, Phil Whalen, Snyder, obviously very precise, et cetera. Ginsburg got freedom, and uh, today. Uh, well, for example, let's just stick with the New American Poetry for a second. They were mostly anti-academics. But mm -hmm. today, if you pick up a, a Norton Anthology, I mean, I don't have a new one since maybe three or four years ago, but most of the people in it are academics. And they seem to be, people seem to be into stories as, as opposed to what you can do with form. So I'm always wondering, and I'll ask you to this, uh, have we reached a dead end in terms of what we've accomplished in form? You know, I, I obviously you have that concrete Richard Costellans from many years ago, but is it more just um, multicultural and letting in multigender more, you know, letting in more and more stories and making a sense of inclusion for the humanity of it as opposed to the uh, the search for form? Tony, why don't you start and let me hear what you think about that. I, I mean, I have two lives. Uh, I'm a, a formal poet and a free verse poet. Uh, and my attitude towards form is that uh, form is wild. Uh, it's not constraining. Uh, you know, the ancient Chinese poet uh, Han Yu said, writing in form is like dancing in chains, right? The chains yeah. combine. And find you, you have to figure out how to do the dance within those constraints. And the form can be a sonnet or it can be anything from, uh, you know, any other constraint you decide to put on it, you know. Uh, and and I, th I think that what we're where we are today, I, th I think it's hard to make um, uh, quick uh, summations of it, because the truth is we're living through a renaissance like the world has never seen. Uh, whatever you want out there, it's a smorgasbord. Um, and people are breaking form, making form. Uh, and I believe that when we're, we're thinking about form, we have to talk about more than the traditional questions of how you move across the page. Uh, free verse forms and, and traditional forms, mechanical and organic forms is what uh, Coleridge would call it. The truth is the forms of the future are going to have to do with medium you know what what are they going to be the filmic forms the digital forms you know um and and i i uh, you know the uh the forms that are three-dimensional i believe the poetry is going to uh change and and not die with the change in medium it doesn't have to be on the page mary yeah and i i think there are new forms being invented the golden shovel the duplex <laughs> and those are coming to us from previously excluded voices so um i think let it all in sometimes um there are waves of fashion but then we move on i mean it's a it's a river nicely put i hear you say the golden shovel you know, that, that's a pretty image. You you both have such vital and uh, wild images and 
it just open up open up our vision and um, also our hearts. And this is really um, you two are just both marvelous poets. It's really an honor. You've really nourished uh, my life and the listeners here too. And uh, Jennifer Clymer, she's the director. You know, she does. We started doing these uh, Zoom shows in March 2020 when COVID hit, and there were uh, four four days a week. Now it's three days, and she does these all day long. And maybe about a year after it started on the show one time, she said, you know, we thought that when COVID hit, that it would be the end of creativity, but in fact, it has expanded. And I mean, you two are ample evidence of that right now, but let, let's hear what Jennifer has to say. And then before she does, I just want to thank you both from the bottom of my heart for such a marvelous reading. Thank you. Um, today is episode 122 of Harry's Poetry Hour. Mm. So in terms of the the breadth and scope of what we've been able to do as a creative platform for the residents, I mean, that's that's a whole other thing. It's the 416th episode of Creative Chaos. But what Harry has been able to do, reaching across state borders, reaching across country borders to bring people in for this hour weekly to celebrate the art of language, it it just makes me so joyful. And Harry, we're probably going to go to two days a week now that things are starting to open up. But Harry's Poetry Hour is never going away. <laughs> Someday. <laughs> um, who do you have on for next what? week? They're, they're going to have big shoes to fill. Uh, Mary, Tony, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Harry, who do you have up for next week? Next week, we have two wonderful poets, Lori and Bart Edelman. Oh, nice. <laughs> Excellent. Um, I was going to say with Halloween coming up and it being October, um, maybe we find someone that doesn't have a lot of happy poems, but we have Tony on already. So <laughs> that just cracked me up. This isn't a happy poem. Let's read it. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. Guys, thank you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We are going to play some games coming up next. Uh, don't miss Harry's Poetry Hour next week. You guys were awesome. Thank you.